Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's about that time again to take you through the gear that we carry with us on our travels, cracking right on with the bag itself. This is the 10 litre Protector Plus, measuring 30 by 25 centimetres. It is high speed, low drag, and half the size of a standard pack. Back to refresh, it comes with molly panels on the front, back and side, but we've made a few aftermarket modifications, such as. We've taken the sternum straps off the old pack and attached them to the front and back, making an underhang for attaching our sleeping bag. We've attached clip-on molly buckles to the side panels, and that allows us to carry extra pieces of gear on the outside, such as camera tripods. We've also clipped a Sunto button compass onto the tightening strap so that getting a general bearing is no more than a head tilt away and we've tidied up any excess webbing with elastic EDC bands as if there is one thing I've learned over the years is that is having your straps hang loose all over the shop is a good way to end up in Snag City and lastly behind the velcro patch we tuck away a small razor blade for quick access to a cutting tool for the finer tasks such as gathering up tree bark tinder or collecting up some of old mother nature's finest wild edibles and the end result is a pack much better suited for our trips to the wild it's small enough for a casual day hike light enough for a comfortable mountain climb yet still packed with enough gear for an overnight camp or multi-day trip it's your low profile all-in-one grab and go gtfo kit so let's get right down into the contents as despite its small size we're still able to carry all of the essentials as well as a few luxuries so starting off with the gear pouch that contains all the tools of the trade the pouch itself is a one tigris measuring 16 by 15 centimeters it is waterproof to an extent and features tons of elastic straps that all help to keep our gear secure and neatly organized. Kablam! Now that's organized. Starting on the left side, we've upped the compass game with a silver expedition, which features a traditional acrylic base plate alongside an adjustable rotating bezel, which allows us to set our magnetic declination, which in turn ensures that our course is true. But also included are a couple of bonus features, such as a magnifying glass and a sighting mirror. Two features which have their uses in map reading and navigation, but of course also double up as useful survival tools. The lens can be used for fire starting on sunny days and the mirror can be used as a sunlight reflecting signal mirror for search and rescue. A huge upgrade overall, especially when you consider that this used to be the old compass, magnifying glass and signal mirror combo. So being able to condense all of that into a lightweight all-in-one, well, that just seems like a good idea to me. And plus, the mirror housing also protects the face of the compass from accidental damage, and for that, it is invaluable. Moving on to a new addition, the Sawyer Mini Life Straw. A physical membrane water filter that's capable of turning even the most murkiest of fluids into crystal clear, safe, drinkable water. Here's how it works. Two components, the filter and the bladder. Head down to the stream and fill up the bag with water. Screw on the filter to the threaded mouth of the bladder and then squeeze and roll up the bag like a tube of toothpaste and the water will get pushed through a series of microscopically porous membranes which capture and remove any dirt, grit or bacteria that may have been lurking in the water and the end result is clean, filtered and drinkable water without the need for boiling or chemical treatment. Look at that, that's goddamn glorious. For the longest time, I've been unable to trust these types of water filters because you can never actually see them working, but having to stop throughout the day to build, fire and boil water burns too much daylight and chlorine tablets taste like a piss-filled swimming pool. So we bit the bullet, made the switch, and well, we've been using it for going on two years now and I've yet to die of dysentery. So it's top marks from me, it goes in the kit. And next is the multi-tool. A no-name, no-brand, full stainless steel construction. It features two knives, 
two saws, a pair of pliers and wire cutters, offering great utility for the finer chores of the outdoors, such as processing tinder from fallen branches, food prep for wild edibles and cord cutting. But it's not the knives or pliers that I value most, nay, it's the saw blades, as they offer extra woodworking utility. So, for example, when the tumbleweed of grey comes barreling towards you and you've got a quick time double down your shelter, then being able to quickly knock up a few of those extra wooden tent pegs, well, that's easy game, easy life, no worries on those stormy nights. Oh my god! And now, onto the fire making materials. The go to foolproof method of starting fires are BCB stormproof matches. They will burn even after becoming wet, after being dropped, and they do not extinguish after being blown by strong winds. So, come rain, hail, or shine, we'll get that fire going, easy pips. They are the best tool for the job, I feel, as they are so forgiving, and so we pack a lot of them and we keep them stored in their own solid case. But although matches are the go-to, it would be very silly to not also carry a lighter, so for backup we carry a simple electric lighter. Though matches are finite and lighters can break, so when all else fails, the ferrocerium rod is there to save the day. Observe its length and its girth. It's five inches long and half an inch thick, with a tungsten carbide striker connected via lanyard as far as ferro rods go it's quite the beefy boy. It has no trouble producing those hot showers of sparks to get those tinders going, but that is due in most part to the striker more so than the rod, as that strong, crisp 90 degree edge makes shaving off metal easy and effortless. It is heavy, unnecessarily so perhaps, but I feel it needs to be this large to accommodate that pre-drilled hole that hosts the lanyard, as we have found that over time, if the lanyard is connected to the rod via a handle and the glue to the handle fails, well, then the ferro rod will fly straight out, potentially across the forest floor, and well, if you lose that, what's arguably your most important fire starting item, then well, you are well and truly shafted. So, taking on this extra way for an extra layer of security, I feel is a fair trade and that's how we roll. And our go-to cordage of choice is of course 550 fire cord. With a tensile strength of 550 pounds, 250 kilograms, it's perfect for your hammocks, your guy lines and your bear bags. It is suitable for all manner of outdoor tasks aside from climbing and is composed of seven individual smaller strands that can be taken out and used for the more trivial tasks that do not require such high tensile strength. But this cordage is special in that it also helps us build fire. For you see, as for a negligible increase in weight, this cordage has an additional eighth strand of synthetic flammable tinder. So if natural tinders are scarce or completely drenched, we just cut out a small chunk of that inner red strand, fluff it up, throw sparks at it, and it will combust into flame. A single 3 inch strand will burn for around 30 seconds, which is plenty of time for that flame to transfer to our kindling. And that is fire secured. And in event of emergency, we carry a spare mobile phone, a trustworthy, reliable Nokia, along with one spare battery and multiple prepaid SIM card, each on different networks, as not all network coverage is created equal. Where one network may offer zero bars, the other may offer one bar. So, short of having a sat phone, this is how we roll the dice. Plus, you can also play Snake on it, and so that's bedtime boredom cured. And tucked away round the back, we have a few additional items, such as the squeeze bag for the soya, as well as a cotton bandana, which is to be used as a backup water filter should the soya stop working. It also doubles up as an additional level of filtration if, for example, the only water source available is a pond covered in a thick film of duckweed, then running it through the bandana first to capture and clear away the brunt of the duckweed leaves less work for the soya to do and thus preserves its lifespan. For an extra method of water sterilization, we also carry Oasis Chlorine Dioxide Water Purification Tablets. A staple of any survival kit, one tablet will disinfect one litre of water. They are a good backup to have and have a top tier weight to effectiveness ratio, though they are usually not anybody's first choice as the taste is so foul. Also tucked away round the back, we have our simple first aid kit. Kablam! 
all the good stuff. Crepe bandages cut down to a practical size, an assortment of plasters, a vial of antiseptic liquid in a thoroughly rinsed repurposed cologne bottle, spare water purification tablets, antiseptic wipes, steri strips, and inside of this odd looking capsule we have Pseudochrome, which is an all-in-one antiseptic and anti-inflammatory healing cream. It disinfects and protects any open cut or wound, but also effectively treats burns, bites, blisters and stings. And since those things tend to be the most common of outdoor injuries, then having something that's purpose built to counter all of those unwanted conditions seems like a good idea to me. Additional pouch items include a small 100 decibel signal whistle for use in emergencies as a whistle is louder and travels further than a shout. And for overall security, we keep the pouch directly attached to the backpack via a dummy cord. This is a length of paracord with a carabiner on either side that connects the zip of the pouch to the zip of an interior pocket inside the backpack. So, should we ever make the mistake of forgetting to repack the pouch, well, then we'll soon bloody know about it because it's a foolproof failsafe. And that covers the gear pouch, now onto the cookware. Our choice of bottle is the Clean Canteen. Stainless steel with a 800 milliliter capacity, it boils water, so it's equal to all others in that regard, but we chose this particular bottle simply because of the lid, as it is thick, simple and threaded, as opposed to our previously spring catch lid bottle, which eventually failed, stopped closing, and well, made for one leaky disaster. But never mind that. Additionally, for a quick quality of life improvement, we've tightly wound brass wire around the threads for that patented bootleg brass wire bail handle for easy placement and retrieval of the bottle from the campfire. No burns here. To complement the bottle, we also have a nesting 450 milliliter Tox titanium cup, which too has been fitted with a brass wire bail handle around the rim for easy retrieval. And when not being used for coffee, cooking or parboiling, it serves as the lid so that the water in the bottle can boil faster and more efficiently. And for when we want to cook up the goods over the campfire, we bust the tent peg and wire mesh combo four stainless steel 10 pegs and one 15 by 15 wire mesh plate. Together, form the lightweight and portable barbecue rack of hopes and dreams. This time around though, the mesh is not a jaggedy ass piece of plasterboard reinforcement. This time around, it is a legitimate Bunsen burner plate, which is specifically designed for air quote grilling over high heat. And as such, it has a much cleaner crimped down edge so that it's not snag city or tetanus every time it stabs you in the finger. And also, it flexes and retains its shape much better. And as such, when not in use, it can be easily bent to fit in between the bottle and the nesting cup for tidy storage. But most importantly, a completely snug fit. So that when all items are pressed tightly together, you can shake it around or hold it upside down and nothing will rattle, clang or clink because the whole unit is locked tight. It is silent. And so, not only are we high speed low drag, but we are also splinter cell. Now for our shelter setup, we have returned to our roots of hammock camping. Not out of choice, I should add, but simply because it is the only shelter setup that can actually fit inside this tiny pack. Compromises have been made, and the hammock and tarp combo of choice is the DD Super Light. Made of lightweight ripstop nylon, the tarp is a spacious 3x3 meters, is fully waterproof, and offers adequate protection from rain and wind on all sides. It features 19 attachments points so can be set up in a variety of configurations and altogether both hammock and tarp weigh a total of 1.6 pounds which is super light and a pleasure to carry especially in comparison to our previous one-man tent which weighed three pounds and was significantly bulkier. The hammock is wide, very spacious, we can wrap it around ourselves for a fully enclosed cocoon mode, and it is also 8.8 .8 feet in length. So, very decent proportions for its compact size. To set up, we begin by wrapping nylon tree huggers around the tree. Next, our hammock, which has a pre-tied loop on the end of its whoopee sling, connects to a carabiner, which in turn connects to the tree hugger on either side. All in all, setup is super quick, 
and super simple. So should we ever find ourselves stopping to take a break, a quick time 30 second hammock setup and 10 second takedown, we can sit back and relax anytime we want with no trouble, and that sure beats the hell of sitting down on rocks and pine cones. As for the guy line and tarp, we have a paracord guy line with seven prussic knots scattered down the length. These prussic knots are super handy to have as they slide along side to side for easy adjustment, but as soon as they're taut and you let go, they clinch up super tight and lock in place. The tarp connects to the guy line via these prussic knots, so positioning is easy to adjust and keep secure. To set up, one end of the guy line will connect to the tree hugger's carabiner, but the loose end of the guy line, which has to be long enough to accommodate all the varying distances between trees, has to be tied up manually. So we run the loose end of the guy line through the carabiner on that end and pull it taut. We then slide up a prussic knot to where it needs to be, lock it into place, and then drag that over to another prussic knot down the line, clip them both together, and then slide that prussic knot down. And now the whole line is in place, secure, and taut. But most importantly, this particular setup makes it super easy to take down, as we just relax the knot, unclip the carabiner, easy pips, whole thing comes apart. Lots of prussics, lots of carabiners. All very confusing, but since everything is pre-tied and self-locking, both setup and takedown is super quick and super simple. Not quite as fast as a tent, but pretty damn close. But hammocks are of course completely situational and are virtually useless in the plains or halfway up the side of a cliff where there are no trees. So in event of being caught with the proverbial trousers round your ankles, we also carry an emergency bivy bag. It is essentially a waterproof one-man tent with no poles. It's nothing glamorous, it is essentially a glorified trash bag. But when you gotta hunker down at a moment's notice, it is sufficient. It's waterproof, it's windproof, it folds up super small and weighs virtually nothing, it is a staple part of any survival kit and is a downright essential for any hammock camper that dares to leave the comfort and security of the forest. And for warmth and insulation, we have a free season sleeping bag. Measuring 30 by 17 centimeters, it is nearly half the size and weight of the previous sleeping bag, at the cost of it being thinner and much shorter in length. End to end it measures 6 foot 1 inches long which is more than adequate, not an inch of space goes to waste. And it has a temperature rating of 0 degrees Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit. Which isn't a great rating but to the extent that I've used it in sub-zero weather, namely minus 3 degrees Celsius, we have found that it does provide enough insulation to stay reasonably comfortable but with a fire going nearby, well, then we are absolutely snug as a bug. But if it ever does get a bit too chilly, then we also have the Mylar blanket, otherwise known as a space blanket. Carried by paramedics and used frequently on spacecraft for thermal control, its highly reflective surface ensures that most, if not all, body heat is directed back towards the wearer. The difference it makes is night and day. Without it, you can shiver and shut down, but with it on, wrapped snugly around you, or lining your sleeping bag, you're like a jacket potato just baking in the oven. All in all, it is a cheap and cheerful solution to help prevent the onset of hypothermia. And our last shelter item is the Jurasonic Solar Powered Wind Up Radio. Going old school like it's 1962, no condoms, just goat skin. Our radio is considered a shelter item because on a multi-day trip where we are away from the world, we can listen out for those scheduled weather forecasts that give us an idea of how we should go about our day. Perhaps to avoid taking the narrowest, windiest route up the mountain because you've got 90 mile per hour gale force winds coming your way, or perhaps not to worry at all because it's going to be brilliant sunshine all day so you go ahead you bask in the rays and those two extremes in weather are particularly common when camping here in summer as one day it may be a high pressure hottest day of the year next day it's a breakout of thunderstorms and it's nice to be able to know when and where those thunderstorms will occur because we want to chase them because that's great footage through this evening and overnight, though, it is worth pointing out thunderstorms will make their way up from the south. And as well as that, with clear skies through central areas, you could see the Perseus meteor shower.
And as for the overly large survival knife that all kits seem to be incomplete without, we have our trusty custom Becca BK7. There is not much to say that I haven't already said in a review video, other than that we're keeping it clean, we're keeping it sharp, and all in one piece this time around. The go-to for any heavy duty bushcraft chore, its weight gives it the functionality of a small hatchet for chopping and shaping wood, and its length and shape gives it good use as a trowel for digging fire pits, as well as gathering up those tasty edible plant roots. Two things that we do much of, so it's the best of both worlds. However, since the knife is as large as the pack itself, we ran into an issue, such as the stock sheath not being able to fit inside, and so we had to improvise. We pulled out the bare bones plastic scabbard from within the sheath, cut it down to size, and then wove paracord through each of the holes. This effectively narrows down the scabbard, pressing against the knife, which gives the whole thing a tight, rattleless fit and retention when held upside down. So despite it being very bare bones and completely bootleg, it does still perform every role that a sheath should, short of having a belt attachment. But most importantly, it can now fit inside the pack, snug as a bug, it is a match made in heaven. And that covers the gear, but we're not done yet. As to pack everything away, we place the shelters in the bottom, bivy in the back, knife and bottle on either side for balance, and pouch in the front, which leaves behind one big slot right in the middle, which perfectly accommodates our homemade MRE. 4,500 calories of ready to eat food, all in a package that measures 16 by 12 centimeters. Enough food for two days in a super small package. The contents of the MRE change every time, but we always aim for at least 4,500 calories of nut or seed based food, as those are the most calorie dense options being primarily composed of fat and protein. The bulk of the calories come from pouches of chocolate peanut butter. Yes, not the healthiest of options, but the most delicious. Each 225 gram pouch contains 1,300 calories, which is an incredibly dense calorie to size ratio. Two pouches alone are a full day's worth of energy. And that is due to its high fat and protein content, having 54 grams of fat 29 grams of protein and 15 grams of carbohydrates per 100 grams. A 125 gram pack of honey roasted peanuts offer us 670 calories, most of which is fat and protein, but its honey coating offers us a valuable bump in carbohydrates as well. The go-to trail food of choice is none other than sesame seed coated caramel peanuts, which are absolutely delicious and are usually the first to go. This 175 gram package contains 870 calories and its thick caramel coating gives us a big chunk of carbohydrate to help balance out the protein and fat heavy content. For a quick eats while on the move, we have an assortment of protein and oat bars. Cranberry and oat protein bites, one 60 gram pouch contains 200 calories. One 80 gram double chocolate protein flapjack bar offers 355 calories. And two Trek bars or protein oat flapjacks weighing in at 40 grams each. Together, both contain 362 calories. And since they are both oat based, they also offer some good complex carbohydrates to help balance out our macros. Altogether, the calorie content of the food totals 4,800 calories, and the macro ratio is 40% fat, 30% protein, and 30% carbohydrates. The carbs are there to prevent us from going into keto, and the high fat content ensures that we get as many calories in as small a package as possible. Also included are a couple of luxuries such as sachets of coffee and sugar, one sachet equaling one serving, a small collapsible toothbrush along with a bullet shaped small tube of toothpaste to ensure that we stay minty fresh while out on the trail, and lastly we have three sticks of soap and three sticks of solid deodorant. One stick of each per day helps to keep us fresh and squeaky clean, but also since a main ingredient of both is eucalyptus oil, this also does doubles up as our insect repellent. So using it on both clothes and on body, it's two birds, one stone, and we have found it to be quite effective. So with all things now tucked away in their proper place, that leaves behind only two inches of extra space on top. 
We use this space to pack away a couple pairs of extra socks, as well as a quick change of clothes. We don't usually pack clothing items right at the top, but for the sake of the video, we do today. And that concludes, ladies and gentlemen, the gear that we carry with us on our travels. All the essentials, as well as a few luxuries, all in a lightweight and low profile, high speed pack. Its total weight comes to 12 and a half pounds, which is definitely on the lighter side of things, but not as light as it could be. There are a couple of redundancies, some items are far heavier than they have to be, and there are a couple of luxuries that we can certainly do without. It's far from perfect but we'll work it out over time the ideal goal is to get it down to eight and a half pounds which is a bit of a stretch and a tall order but over time we'll iron out the creases and we'll see which way the wind blows but until then that's the kit that has served us well thus far and so i hope you found this video helpful and informative and i will see you round bros peace